Uh, so please keep these two in prayer. And then my mother-in-law, Joanne Tomkowitz, really needs your prayer. She's taken a turn for the worse the other day or just uh, desperately needs your prayer. So we're going to pray for these two folks. Let's bow in prayer right now. Father, I'm so grateful for uh, the Bible study that we just had as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so grateful, Father, for the blessing of the wisdom that you have given to us, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that uh, it, it, it sets us apart, Father, as far as our understanding. And we just pray that you'd bless us today. We do pray for Jim and Patty, that you please touch Pat's body. We pray for healing, uh, that this COVID thing would be uh, eliminated in her soon. We pray for the blood clots in her lungs, that you'd allow them to dissolve and just strengthen her, Father. We, we ask you to lift her up and encourage Jim. Just help him, Lord, to, to be strong. Uh, I know he's weary. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd lift him up. Uh, even that, uh, I'm thinking of Isaiah 40, Father, that they that wait upon the Lord shall be renewed and mount up with wings as eagles. Pray the same for Bill and Jen and the Aulis family, Lord, and lift up Ethan to you. And Lord, touch the bodies of these two dear ones. And then for Joanne, we just lift her up and pray, Father, that you'd invigorate her and, and give her. Uh, Lord, we want her. She wants to see her grandkids grow up. And just pray, Father, you'd give her some more time and bless her. Thank you for the grace you've given to uh, Ed. And I just commit them to you and ask for uh, a reprieve and a blessing. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless our time today. May Jesus Christ be magnified in our midst. We thank you in his precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. We'll open it up to hymn 409, As the Deer, hymn 409. As the deer planteth o'er the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I were to worship you. My strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You're my friend, and my brother, even though you are a king, I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship.
worship you. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, just a couple of announcements today. On Sunday, September 25th, during our morning service, we're going to have a parent-child dedication. Uh, Johnson and Tanya Kukula will be dedicating baby Jolina to the Lord. If any other parents would like to dedicate their children to the Lord and haven't done so, please see Pastor. Uh, this week is the PARBC Full Conference at Faith Baptist Church in State College. There's information on the back table. If you're unable to, to attend, please pray for the conference. And uh, we are in great need of people to help with teaching the children and our helpers to assist the teachers in the classroom. If we can get enough volunteers, the Lord, the, uh, the load <laughs> would not have to fall on one or two people. We would like to get enough people so that we can rotate responsibilities. And if you're able uh, to help, please see Charlie or Lynn Noble. This time I'll have the ushers come forward as we take our regular tithes and offerings. James, could you pay for the offering, please? Amen. Thank you, Garrett. That song was played at our wedding reception. I love you, Lord. And it uh, warms the cockles of my heart. Tell Al, we're, we're, there's a good chance we're going to have a special music. A young lady's going to be singing. I'm not sure if we can set up a mic because she probably will not be tall enough to reach here. So over there. Okay, so when she comes up, we'll just move that up. Is that what we'll do? Okay, let's just wait and see if she's ready and then, okay, good to have you all. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 14 for our scripture reading, Luke chapter 14. Thank you for coming today. 
Last Sunday morning, we had a, a phenom- our best attendance since um, the quarantine, and uh, I got spoiled. Of course, some, we're Baptists, and you know we usually come late, so there still be some people coming in. Uh, but I was very blessed, and appreciate those of you that are coming out to church faithfully. All right, Luke chapter 14, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to read verses 7 down through 11. For, uh, Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. Please follow along as I read. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer for that blessing. Father, we ask you today to bless and honor your word. I pray, Father, you'd help me to properly preach, interpret, and expound the scriptures. And I realize, Father, uh, our, the authority that we have to declare your word is purely bound by proper interpretation and that when I stray off of rightly dividing or interpreting the scriptures, uh, the power's gone. And so, Father, I pray today that you would help me to, um, everything that I say, it would just be 100% accurate in harmony with the scriptures. And Father, I pray that you would challenge us regarding one aspect of our flesh that we all battle with. Pray, Father, that you would humble us today for your glory. And we just thank you again. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And we're going to have special music, okay? Have, uh, this Tamel came up to me last week, and as she was so fired up, she said, Can I sing? I thought she wanted to just sing right there for me. She wanted to sing to the church. And uh, so we're going to get, give us a minute to melt to get a microphone for you, okay? Because we want you front and center. Now, she's holding a book, so um, maybe we can. Okay, thank you, Talala. We're going to move that one. We want everybody to see you when you're singing. Oh, good man. And on accompaniment is going to be Garrett Lyon. And I now present to you to Mel Marks.
Amen? Amen. All right. Good job. Okay, let's uh, take our hymn books out and we'll have another song. All right, let's turn to hymn 255, Fairest Lord Jesus, hymn 255. Please take your Bibles again and turn to Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. This morning I want to preach uh, on an issue that uh, I find myself struggling with often, and I think if you are a child of God and have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, uh, I may not be alone on this. Uh, Over the last few months, maybe a year or two, there's been a, a Benjamin Franklin quote that keeps coming back uh, in my mind. And uh, here's what he said. He said, There is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Uh, And I can relate to that. Uh, Pride. You know, one of the three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. It is something we will always, and by that I mean if you're a child of God, and you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, you're going to be very conscious of your sin. Uh, and, And, you know, that's not a bad thing. That's the fact that the Spirit of God dwells within you. When you can sit under preaching or, 
or you know, hear rebuke about sin and feel nothing, there may be that you don't have the Spirit of God within you. But a child of God wrestles and is very conscious of his or her own weaknesses. And pride, of course, is uh, it's just one of those things that you and I will contend with till the day we die. But do not despair, uh, because you need to be aware of it. You need to understand what the Bible says about it. And uh, like Franklin says, uh, beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases, and it's still alive. But that doesn't mean we should stop beating it down, stifling it, and mortifying it. We, that, that's something we need to always do. Uh, you know, the, when we have love, it's almost contrasted uh, that when you and I are motivated and acting on love, uh, it will mortify, beat down, and stifle pride. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, Charity or love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. And that's what pride is. So may God fill us today with love, the love of Christ, love of one another, so that we might keep pride in check. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning because we want to walk humbly before you. And we understand that there is this thing in us called the pride of life that is continually vaunting itself up, is continually um, being offended when our pride is injured. And uh, Father, we're so thankful that your word speaks to this matter so much. So Lord, help us, help those listening uh, that may not think that they have a pride issue uh, to first realize that they do have a pride issue. We all do. And uh, Lord, uh, it may mean that some folks need to humble themselves to salvation. Uh, truly, our first great humbling is realizing that we can never do enough to match your perfect holy standard. And only when we understand our true condition before you are we ready to humble ourselves and put ourselves at the mercy of the cross. So Lord, we ask your blessing now on the word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Here's the outline this morning. Three things surprise you. Three things. And they all begin with a P. Does that surprise you? Uh, three things about pride. Number one, pride promotes itself. Pride says, me first. Secondly, pride provides for self. Uh, in other words, in a boastful way. Uh, you know, the idea that, um, that, you know, I don't need any help. I'm not a charity case. That can be pride. There are times, folks, where God wants us to be a charity case. But if you're proud... You're not going to be. And then thirdly, pride provokes God. Two times in the New Testament, the Bible says that God resists the proud. And, and that means, folks, whether you're saved or lost, that God is continually responding to us throughout any given day. And on those times when we're lifting ourselves with pride, when we respond to things in our life arrogantly, God, in one way or another, is going to actively resist us. But when you and I humble ourselves in any given situation, God is going to, going to draw near to us. He's going to give a grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I need a whole lot more heaping of grace in my life. So let's jump in. First, Luke chapter 14, pride promotes self above others. Luke chapter 14 Jesus is in a situation where he sees, really an everyday scene, he sees people going in and, and sitting, sitting themselves at the table, and uh, apparently he's watching people and how they come in and how they, you know, where they sit specifically. And in fact, look at verse 7. He put forth a parable to those which were bidden 
when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, the chief places to sit is the idea. And uh, this kind of thing goes on all the time. And by the way, it's not just, he gives the example of if you're, you're invited to a wedding. But, and, and this is not just, you know, this is not just, okay, this is going to be instruction. Next time I go somewhere where I'm seating, s- sitting somewhere with people, I want to make sure I take note. Folks, this, this scenario happens a million different ways in determining, you know, whether we put ourselves first in a situation or whether we take the low road and, and, and don't put ourselves first. So let's see what he said, beginning in verse 8. When thou art bidden to any man to a wedding, snit, sit, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And by the way, this is not, here's this, here is the formula to look really good before people. I mean, if you want glory, you go somewhere and you take the lowest place, but you can anticipate that someone's going to say, what are you sitting there for? You are our most honored guest. Everybody, hey, you at the top of the place, you get away because we want to honor. And I think sometimes people might expect that. You know, because what does Jesus say? Verse 10, when thou art bidden, go and sit in the lowest room. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher, and then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. This is, again, not a formula on how to be worshipped. It is a formula for humility. In fact, when you and I go and sit in the lowest place, he's not saying, okay, and get ready, because you're going to see, here, here it comes. You're about to look really good, because nine times out of ten, they may not promote you to that big spot, and that's not the point. The point, folks, is that we are to put ourselves in subjection to, it, it's humility. It is to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Pride, in every station in life, pride wants recognition, honor, credit. Somebody once said, there's no telling what could be done for the glory of God if it didn't matter who got the credit. Isn't that a good point? Romans 12 and verse 3 says this, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. In other words, any point that you excel in, You need to be very consciously aware that it's because and only because of what God has done in your life. Not to think of ourselves more highly than he ought. In fact, the Bible says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is a great example, probably the prime example, I want you to turn here, in Isaiah chapter 14. You know, in, in Jesus' time, he uh, rebuked the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, and held, did, did not hold back at all. In fact, what he said to them, I can only imagine, must have been so offensive. Because... The Pharisees and the scribes had the the general population hoodwinked. They looked at the scribes and the Pharisees as the elite among the Jewish people. They elevated them. They, They honored them. They exalted them. And Jesus, no holds barred, said... You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you do. How to win, win friends and influence people? Not by saying that, you know, clearly. But, but he wasn't interested in pleasing them. 
They were the ones that needed the rebuke. But think about it. You are of your father, the devil. The lusts of your father, you do. He was a liar from the beginning. And, and these people, they, they didn't even realize it. That, that Satan was their father. By the way, there's a lot of people today that will believe, they'll cherry pick the Bible. They'll believe some things about the Bible. Like, oh yeah, I believe there's a heaven. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. But then the things they don't like, well, I don't believe there's a devil. Well, wait a minute. Jesus very clearly believed and spoke of the devil being a very real person. In fact, I th I'm convinced that most people that do not believe there's a devil are probably deceived by him. And so here's where you and I need to be very careful. Just as the devil was the father of the blind religious people of his day, so anyone that does not have the Spirit of God is going to be like the devil. And here, let's see, one of the main characteristics of the devil, who before he became Satan, the devil was a anointed cherub, one of the most beautiful angels ever created, called Lucifer. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 11, because this was his downfall. So at one point, he was exalted. He was, again, the, the top tier angel. And in verse 11, God says, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, folks, this is the heart, this is the, this is the crux of pride. And it first dwelt in the bosom of Lucifer. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend. I will be lifted up. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's pride. It's wanting all the glory, all the honor, all the credit that is due to God. What does God say? Remember, pride comes before the fall. Pride goeth before destruction. And that's what happened. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake? In other words, and I look forward to this day. There's coming a time when Satan is going to have his mighty crash. And he is going to be cast down. And he is going to be a pitiful thing to look upon. And you and I will have that delight to look at him and say, this is the one that caused me so much trouble. Because God is going to bring him down. But, that connection, Satan is still very much lifted up with pride and using pride in your life and my life. In fact, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's an interesting statement about pride. And really, if you think about it, in this context, it, it insinuates, implies that before someone comes to faith, pride is a huge issue that they have not even begun to deal with. When you and I first get saved, it is the beginning of our putting pride in place. And look what it is. It's qualifications for church leadership. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that's an old, an, a, a, a Greek word, uh, and by the way, in the scriptures, pastor, bishop, and elder 
are used interchangeably to refer to the same office. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be, and then it lists the qualifications of a pastor or a bishop or an elder. In other words, God is saying that you cannot put someone in leadership in the church unless they meet certain qualifications. And the one I want to bring your attention to is in verse 6. Not a novice. See that word there? Not a novice. That's an interesting term. You ever heard the English word neophyte? Don't be a neophyte. It's actually a Greek word. And that's actually the Greek word that is translated novice here. uh, We would use the the word, actually I say we, probably me back in the 70s. Do they still say you're a greenhorn? Does anybody say that? No, my daughter's telling me, no, they do not, Dad. Uh, I am not, you know, I'm not from this era. (laughs) So, uh, you know, a a greenhorn, someone that's wet behind the ears, do they still say that? They do not. What do they say when somebody is, you know, naive or very immature in a certain area? A young whippersnapper. A young whippersnapper. Thea, I think you just showed your age as well. (laughs) But the, the idea of a novice or a neophyte, literally the idea means newly planted. In fact, the King James translators, oh, I put this on my phone and I don't have it. The King James translators put something to the effect Next to the word novice, they put in the Greek, new in the faith. Something like that. Someone that is newly planted. Somebody that is newly saved. Now think of that. So here's leadership qualifications for the ministry to be a pastor. And it says it must not be a neophyte, a novice. Someone that is newly saved. A new believer. Why? And this is what I want you to look at. Lest, verse 6, the middle part of the verse. Lest, being lifted up with pride. That literal, the word for pride literally means to be obfuscated or blinded by smoke. Lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of who? The devil. See, that's how the devil gets us. Now think of what this is implying. It is saying that if you're going to put someone in church leadership, see, we might think, we might think people generally, you know, have certain, you know, there's certain people, apart from their salvation, apart from them being born again, there's some people that have a disposition towards arrogance, and there's some people that have a disposition toward humility. And so we might think, that somebody that's newly saved but very humble might be in a position where they could be a pastor. But this verse is telling us differently. It's telling us that anyone that is newly planted in the faith is in danger of being lifted up with pride and falling into the condemnation of the devil. I've been thinking about that a lot. And there's an implication there. That before we come to faith, pride is a bigger issue than we would ever think. And it makes sense. Because in order for someone to get saved, they got to humble themselves big time, don't they? And there are so many people that are not willing to do that. Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. In fact, he starts it this way. He's going to be talking about humility. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's interesting because in Proverbs 13 and verse 10, now again, Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. And and now in Proverbs 13, 10, it says, only by pride cometh contention. That's amazing. That's a, that's a blanket statement. You see contention? You see, the, you see arguing and fighting of some sort? There's contention going on? What's the Bible say? Only by pride cometh contention. You put two people together and you want to quell 
contention, at least one of them needs to humble themselves. That's why the Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath. But if you've got two people that are lifting themselves up and pounding their chest, you're going to have major problems there. But again, Philippians 2.3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. One man writing to husbands sympathized with the pride that men often have. And he said this. He said, all of us, he's talking really about um, perceived slights by husbands. He says, all of us listen with concern and introspection to those whom we respect. And we dismiss with derision those whom we think are unworthy to challenge us. He says, poor wives. The bottom line is that insecurity and fear make us angry at perceived criticism. The smallest man has the biggest anger. That's true. Very true. There's a statement that Paul exhorts Timothy. In fact, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul made a statement uh, that has to do with Timothy um, and how he is perceived and it's simply this, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, he says, Let no man despise thy youth. Let no man. Now part of that has to do with how Timmy, Timothy, Timmy, how Timmy conducts himself. How Timothy conducts himself. And that, that Paul is telling Timothy, you know, you don't behave in such a way that you're going to become a stumbling block. But there's also the challenge of, let no man despise thy youth challenging Timothy that as a man called of God, he can still minister to people older than him. Now, by the way, this was one of my favorite verses as a young pastor in my 20s. I love this. Probably quoted it to every adult. Hey, let no man despise thy youth. You know, I know I'm younger than you. But you know what I found out not too long ago? That the term youth that's used here uh, in this text, and in Paul's day, referred to someone, in fact, uh, Irenaeus, who's a church father, said that this term, this to be someone declared youth, it starts when you're in your 30s all the way up to your 40. So Timothy, no doubt, when he probably got saved around the age of 16, and you follow during Paul's first missionary journey, when Paul went to Lystra, and then you see his ministry eventually to where he becomes a pastor and Paul leaves him at the church in Ephesus to, to be their pastor. And so when Paul was writing these epistles to Timothy, he was most likely in his late 30s and then 2 Timothy even 40. So when Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, he's talking to someone that was in his 30s. Isn't that amazing? The challenge is that you and I need to realize that God wants us to humble ourselves and there will be people that you will think are unworthy to exhort you. I mentioned that when I first became a pastor, I was in my late 20s. And when I pastored in Lancaster, I've mentioned this man already, but I want to tell you, and some of you will be this, some of you, if, if I outlive you, you will become illustrations for me of how precious you were to me. But not now, okay? I don't want, don't know anyone. I definitely don't want anyone to get a big head, especially since I'm preaching about pride. But this man who's been with the Lord, his name is Richard Brash. He was in his 90s when I first came to pastor the church that he was at, the church he was going to. He was in his 90s, and I'm in my late 20s, and I was his pastor. And believe me, especially back then, I butted a lot of heads with people simply because I was some, such a young whippersnapper, you know, so such a greenhorn that there were people that could not respond to my ministry because, they're, because of pride. Well, who is this young kid coming along telling something to me like I can learn anything from him? But Richard was not that way. This is the guy that 
for his life, his profession, just to age myself, he made his life profession playing in the orchestra for silent movies. I mean, you're talking like 1700s. No, it wasn't 1700s. But so that's what, and then he retired. And, and now here he is in his 90s. And he's the one that affectionately called me Parson. And he just, it, I, will, I just think of this dear man. And I think of how, you know, whenever I came, it was like royalty came. This man's in his 90s. And he would announce, if he was the one that answered the door, the parson is here. I just remember being so blessed by that. So that man's going to go down as being very special to me. Because, folks, not many 90-year-olds are going to look at someone that's in their 20s and think, who is this guy that he thinks he can do anything in my life? That's pride, is it not? So whether it's husbands with wives... Or any other scenario. Realize this. That God puts everyone in your life. Because he wants to teach you something. And it doesn't matter what their age. There's something you can learn. From your children. From the youngest in the flock. But you won't be able to. If you're lifted up with pride. Secondly. Turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms. Psalm 10. Secondly, pr pride provides for oneself. So pride promotes self. Me first. Before others. I am the most important. And then secondly, pride provides for oneself. In other words, I'm not a charity case. That's pride. What do you think I am that I have to receive a handout? Psalm 10. And by the way, if that applies to us receiving help from others, it's certainly going to be reflected in our need for God because we're not going to need Him. If you and I are exalted by pride, we're not going to be seeking God out. And here's what Proverbs, uh, Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 10 and verse 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. In fact, God is in relatively few of his thoughts. Why? Pride. The pride of his countenance. You see, proud people don't pray because they don't need God. They got this. And, and just praying is a sign that we need God. Proverbs 11 and verse 2 says this, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Listen to this definition of, of pride. Pride is defined as it is an inordinate self-esteem. Inordinate. Out of place. Self-esteem. And of course, we hear the world saying, you need more self-esteem, whereas God's message is, oh, we, are, we have way too much self-esteem. You know, We already love ourselves. Jesus says, we need to love others as we already love ourselves. But then it says this in the definition, inordinate self-esteem, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt for others. You know, sometimes it is pride that causes us to despise other people. We have contempt for them. That's what pride does. Someone once said this, Pride is the only disease that makes everyone else, uh, that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. I like that. You know, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. And it's true. It's so much easier to see pride in other people, but not in ourselves. And by the way, D.L. Moody made this statement. He said, God sends no one away empty except for those who are full of themselves. And that's true. Our last point, God resists the proud. 
but he gives grace to the humble. I want you to take your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. I know we're coming here on time, but I love this text real quickly. 2 Kings 5. And let me just relate it to you. I'll start reading right away at verse 10. Um, actually, let me give you the background. We're, we're going to learn about Naaman, who was captain of the Syrian army. And in fact, it says in um, 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. So Naaman was really esteemed by the king of Syria. Why? Because deliverance came to Syria through him. But notice the way it's worded in this verse. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Now that little point there, that it was God that enabled him to give deliverance was something that's, that probably slipped his, imag- or his understanding. He thought it was him, because that's what pride does. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And that sets the stage for this. He, he, um, he's got leprosy. It, he's doomed for the rest of his life. And then word gets to him that, that uh, there is a prophet in Israel... Now, Syria despised Israel. They were enemies. And the Syrians, especially this captain of the Syrian guard, would look down on the Jews with contempt. The Jews were a despised, despicable people in their mind. And just the very fact that word came to him that that there's possible help for you get healing from the Jews was a distasteful thought. Now, look at verse 10. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, go. So he he gets word to this. He finally finds out who the prophet is, to make a long story short. And and he sends word to the prophet. And he's expecting this prophet. What? The captain of the army of Syria wants to talk to me? Oh, please, let's make way. And I want to go see him. I'm going to give him my audience because he's the great Naaman. Elisha doesn't even show up. He sends a messenger. He's insulted already. Uh, Again, verse 10. Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan. That's a lowly river in Israel. Not one of the mighty rivers in Syria. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought. (laughs) There's our pride. I thought, you know, he's already put himself at the head of the table. He's already, in his mind, he's top in the pecking order at that table, figuratively. You ever put yourself there? Pride does. Behold, I thought. I thought he was going to honor me. I thought he was going to worship me. I thought he was going to give me the rightful due. I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus, those are the mighty rivers in Syria, better than all the waters of Israel? This man's pride was insulted. And by the way, to make a long story short, he was this close to walking away and being a leper for the rest of his life. But somebody appealed to him and he humbled himself. And God healed him. By the way, anytime you and I humble ourselves, God will respond. I read an article of a lady in a church that uh, got involved in a ministry. Uh, it was, I believe this was during the time of the pandemic when it first started. A bunch of people in her church had lost their jobs. And so she began to collect food items to give to the people in her church that, that were without jobs. And there was at least 30 people, a larger church, 30 people without jobs. And and all kinds of people were just so generous. All kinds of food was collected. And then she began to make phone calls. And she she was blown away. Most of the people were too proud to accept the handout. What? In fact, they were insulted, much like Naaman. I don't know. I'm not a charity case. 
I don't need that. She was dumbfounded. And so she said, I was doing something to help people who really needed it, and it was a great feeling. People took something away from me because they were too proud to accept it. Sometimes God may want you to humble yourselves to be a receiver. And if you're always used to being a giver, that, you might have to swallow your pride. Last point. Pride provokes God. Two verses, very familiar. Uh, James chapter 4 and verse se- uh, 6 says, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. First Peter 5.5, 5, he repeats that same phrase. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So, is God resisting you in your life? There's a term the Bible uses that's connected. It goes hand in hand with pride, and it's called haughty. In fact, Proverbs 15, Proverbs 21, verse 24 says, Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. To be haughty is to be, ha, have a high esteem of yourselves. It is to be proud and disdainful. Haughty people are disdainful, overbearing, prideful, swaggering, and obnoxious. That reminds me, you've, you've heard, you may have heard me say this, that uh, years ago when, when Muhammad Ali was traveling, he was at the height of his career, the pilot announced that they were approaching severe turbulence And they instructed everyone to fasten their seatbelts. Some of you know where I'm going with this. A flight attendant noticed that Muhammad Ali's seatbelt was unfastened. And she said, excuse me, sir, would you please fasten your seatbelt? The captain has advised that this could be quite rough. And Ali, in his typical boastful banner, he looked at her and he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she responded very quickly. She said, Superman don't need no airplane. I love that. Some of you act like you haven't heard that before. But is that not pride? You know, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. Well, okay, if you want to be honest about it, he doesn't even need a plane, and you apparently aren't Superman. That's the idea. This past Wednesday, we... um, In fact, I want to invite you. We've been having very special prayer meetings since uh, especially since going online we do a new format we have some new things that that we do that uh, in fact my father-in-law was commenting to me because he's been a part of it and he's been a he's been a big blessing has any those of you that have been a part of it i i feel empty when my father-in-law is not on our zoom prayer meeting and a lot of times it's just because he forgets you know um but one of our ladies this will often happen one of our dear ladies just shared her heart about some struggles that she had had recently. And I cannot tell you the power of that testimony. And as she was sitting there, she she was not painting a great picture of herself as far as revealing, hey, I've had some struggles. But it was so very precious. In fact, as she was talking... I'm thinking, you know, because I had already planned on preaching on pride, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow. And I, I guarantee, here's, here's what pride was probably saying in her heart. Don't share that. Don't say that. That's going to make you look bad. It's going to ruin your reputation. If, if they see that you're struggling with these lowly things, you know, pride does that. Pride is like screaming, don't make yourself look bad. And she just laid it all bare. And I think most of us are listening to that. We're like, I've been there. (laughs) In fact, Charles Spurgeon had a thing. I even mentioned this praying for her that night. He had a thing called the preacher's fainting fits. And, uh, and And I can relate to that. That's what that is. You and I, you will have fainting fits where you are brought low. And I wish you could hear this testimony I wish I had recorded it because the words were so precious. She was talking about her own feeling of unworthiness. And it was, I mean, I just, it screamed to me humility. And you know what? That's the kind of person 
God blesses. In fact, it reminded me, after I was thinking about Spurgeon's quote, I've shared this so many times, I'm going to read it again, because um, this is what pride does. Pride would be insulted. This quote is insulting to any spiritual, haughty person. Here's what Spurgeon said. And, And here's how sometimes our pride can be exposed. He said, brother, if any man thinks ill of you, remember this, do not be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. What? Why, I never. If he charges you falsely on some point, yet be satisfied, for if he knew you, he might, bet, he might change the accusation and you would be no gainer by the correction. Can you see how offensive this is to somebody that's like lifted up with pride? Like, how dare you insult me? Oh, he's not done. If you have your moral portrait painted and it is ugly, be satisfied for it only needs a few blacker touches and it would be still nearer the truth. Now see, the proud person wrangles at that. Why, I've never been so insulted. I'm never coming back. But a humble person hears that and says, that's true. Now, by the way, next time somebody criticizes you, next time somebody thinks ill of you, don't forget that quote. Because oftentimes, it's when you and I are criticized, even if there's a little taint of truth to it, our pride gets in the way. And that's the time when God wants to humble us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder for us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Father, we thank you for the true assessment of our own unworthy condition. And Father, I'm so grateful for such a precious congregation that is filled with humility And I I learn from them, Father, and I pray that you would help us all to walk humbly before you. And Father, there might be some folks here, either in the auditorium or listening, that are not saved. They're not novices, they're not newly planted, because they have yet to humble themselves. See their destitute condition before a holy God. And they have yet to come to the cross empty-handed, so they might be filled by Christ. And I pray, Father, today that those folks would humble themselves and get saved so they can begin through the Spirit of God to deal with the pride in their life. And Lord, for those of us that are saved, help us to walk humbly before You. And when pride rears its ugly head, may we see it for what it is, May we beat it down. May we mortify it. And by your grace, may we conquer it every day. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's stand and we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn 679. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Hymn 679. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus,
Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Amen. You're dismissed.